Welcome. Everything is on track. You are listening to Fork and Bullshit, the Good Place podcast. I'm Vivian. And I'm Jason. We'll be the architects of your afterlife experiment. Today we're talking about Season 4, Episode 4, Tinker, Tailor, Demon, Spy. It was written by Cord Jefferson, directed by Morgan Sackett, and it aired October 17th, 2019. Well, let's get this train at chewin Chuggin. A chuggin. That's better. <laughs> the new residents and the team are playing a game of Magic Pictionary. The game goes awry when Chidi's abstract horse drawing comes to life. Eleanor's panicked about their lack of progress, but their meeting is interrupted by the sudden arrival of a train. Glenn, the demon, has come to the neighborhood with important information. That's not the real Michael. He insists that it's Vicky in a Michael suit trying to sabotage their experiment. We're not calling anyone until we figure some things out. We have questions. Yeah, for example, if you're a devil, how come you're not wearing Prada? Glenn suggests calling the judge, but the team refuses. Glenn says that they were told everyone in the bad place was evil and beyond repair, and now he's not sure if he believes that. Plus, Sean is so mean. Glenn shows them photos of the Michael suit and tells them Michael knows about it. Michael admits he did. The team's confidence in him is shaken. They put Michael and Glenn in separate rooms to get to the bottom of it. Well, he might be our friend, or he might be a lying trickster who just looks like our friend. A classic Mary Kate Olsen. Michael confesses to his lies, but insists Sean sent Glenn to undermine the team's trust in each other. Glenn says Linda was part of the plan so they could come to the neighborhood and do the switcheroo. The team asks Michael to take off the demon suit to see if it's really him, but he refuses. He tells them about his true form, a 6,000 foot tall fire squid with tentacles and teeth everywhere. He's worried not only that his true form will ruin the experiment, but they'll look at him differently and they won't want to be friends with him anymore. I think I speak for everyone here when I say, I really have to see this. Janet creates a lie detector, but when she tries to use it on Glenn, he explodes. Eleanor goes on a walk to think and runs into Chidi, who helps her realize how she can test Michael. Eleanor returns to Mindy's and decides they need to call the judge and have her reset the experiment. Michael counters with another idea. He'll blow himself up. That way, they can continue the experiment and he'll see them in a few months. I wish I were saying this in different circumstances, but take it sleazy. Before Michael can blow himself up, Jason jumps in and handcuffs Janet. Turns out it was bad Janet all along. Jason and Michael decide to go to the bad place to get their Janet back, while Tahani and Eleanor manage the neighborhood. Okay, let's go get our girl. Not a girl. Okay, so the title of the episode is Tinker Tailor Demon Spy, Mm -hmm. which is a play on the book slash movie Tinker Tailor Soldier Spy. That had Tom Hanks in it, right? Gary Oldman. Wow. (laughs) I had that wrong. (laughs) Okay. Um, It's a 1974 novel by a British author, John Le French name. Le French name. Wow. What is it? By British author John Le Carré. It follows the endeavors of an aging spy to uncover a Soviet mole in the British Secret Intelligence Service. So, I mean, it's it's not point on point samesies. But it is similar. There's a mole. And we got to figure out who it is. I don't really like this title because I feel like it just gives it away. It gives away what the entire episode's about. You know that there's someone who's infiltrated mm-hmm. before you even watch it. It's a no, bit it's, much. No, it is. It's, it's very fair point. However, not everybody knows titles. So the titles aren't shown okay, at the beginning true. of the episodes. That's true. It Pe- only says chapter something. Yeah. Okay. This is chapter 42, I believe. But yeah, people are really only aware of the episode titles if they're on social media and actively looking for the titles. True. Like people like us. Yes. People that go to Reddit forums. (laughs) (laughs) Right. Or if you're watching it in the future when it's on Netflix, it shows you the episode titles. That's true. So what did you think about the episode as a whole? I was pleasantly surprised. Okay. I enjoyed the little twist that turned out to be what I was not expecting. Mm. The whole bad Janet. I mean, a lot of people online were predicting that it was not our Janet and not our Michael and maybe not our Eleanor. Blah, 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 blah. (laughs) Yeah. But the way they revealed it made me happy that it wasn't our Janet. 
Okay. It made me satisfied. It didn't make me frustrated and think, well, this is just dumb. You're cheating. Like, it's been our Janet the entire time. And now suddenly you're just saying that it wasn't our Janet. Like, right. It makes sense in retrospect. Yes. Okay. And it also makes me happy because that means Jason and Janet are still together. Yeah. That made me really happy too. <laughs> When I first watched the episode, I was pretty disappointed, actually, that Janet had been replaced with a bad Janet. Kind of because I didn't want all of these people to be right. Mm. (laughs) It's not that I wanted to be right and I wanted other people to be wrong. I just felt like it was kind of predictable. Right. But I feel like her behavior definitely does make a lot more sense with that knowledge in mind. And I really was trying to justify all of her behavior this season by thinking it was part of like her evolution. But her suggestion to punch John is a dead giveaway that I ignored because it didn't fit my narrative. (laughs) Mm -hmm. Yeah, you definitely did mention that last episode in Fork and Bullshirt. You asked me what I thought about that. Mm -hmm. And I just wrote it off as some funny little thing that... You know, girlfriends would say to each other, but I happily admit defeat. Mm. And like you said, I'm glad Janet didn't break up with Jason. I really did feel like it would be weird to go through so much effort in the last half of last season, getting them back together, only to break them up at the beginning of the Mm -hmm. season. It didn't really make any sense with the long-term goals of the show. And it is kind of cool because we do know now that bad Janets can be rebooted as many times as good Janets and can learn and evolve and, you know, learn all these new skills like how to lie. Because the last time we saw a bad Janet trying to be a good Janet, she melted Mm -hmm. after two seconds. She has been with them for over a month at this point, maybe a couple of months. Mm -hmm. That's a pretty long time to sustain all of that. Yep. I don't know. I'm kind of wondering if this is going to lead to future Janets being less black and white, bad and good. Right? Right. That's an interesting idea. Because now they're multi-layered. It's not just one type of person. Although the core of bad Janet is still bad Janet, right? Mm -hmm. (laughs) I wonder if we'll explore the idea of what makes Janets good or bad. Whether it's their introduction into whichever neighborhood they're supposed to be a part of right whether they're brought into the bad place or brought into the good place and that would i don't know flip a janet switch inside be like okay now i'm in bad place territory i've got to be bad right because we know that it's not whoever first boots them up because michael booted up our janet in the first place he specifically went to find a good place janet so we know that they're like manufactured most likely differently or stored in different areas right. until they can be activated. You know, it'd be interesting if we found the original Janet. Ooh, that's what I want. I want that. Mm-hmm. Give me the original Janet. I feel like she's way closer to the God than Eleanor is. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, moving on. Wait, 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 before we do though, is bad Janet staying with Tahani and Eleanor just so that the neighborhood isn't going to collapse? Because don't they need a Janet? Right. And we don't don't see her with Michael and Jason. We're in the medium place at the moment. And I don't believe the medium place needs a Janet to maintain itself. But doesn't a neighborhood need a Janet to maintain itself? Yeah, but Mindy never had a Janet. No, but she's not a neighborhood. She's just a house. She's a lonely island. Okay. Shout out to Lonely Island. So (laughs) maybe as soon as it progresses into more than one building and more people, then it needs a Janet to maintain. And technically, wait, she didn't create any of those Janet babies, though. Do you think Janet babies are going to go haywire? That could be fun. I just, I wonder what the state of the neighborhood is going to be when they do not have a Janet in charge. Right. Because if bad Janet is going to stay in those handcuffs, she's basically just going to be a drunk toddler the entire time. Mm -hmm. And uh, I don't think that's going to be super helpful. That's interesting (laughs) because I don't want them to go that direction you don't want them to focus on the neighborhood right because that's we're in the final stretch we're in the last seven or eight episodes i need them to begin to focus on their end game right i don't want them to focus on oh here comes some more shenanigans to deal with <laughs> Whoop! all these little janet babies are losing their heads right i want to deal with the actual morality of the good place and the bad place and what the judge is going to do in this whole situation so i don't want them to get too sidetracked 
Right. But if things in the neighborhood start to go haywire, the actual subjects are going to notice that. Yes. Which could begin some storylines. Yes. Very true. I'm hoping that we'll do a little bit of back and forth, but mostly stay with Jason and Michael next episode. Mm -hmm. I think they're going to go back and forth. Yeah. We'll see. Should be interesting. (laughs) Immediately at the beginning of this episode, when Michael is trying to convince Eleanor to relax and, you know, just take a break, take a breather, (laughs) maybe have a slumber party. That was, you know, all these little red herrings that we've had over the past few episodes to make us doubt Michael's trueness. Yeah. (laughs) Um, it just reminded me a lot of in season one, episode six, when Eleanor is really worried that Michael's going to figure out that she doesn't belong <laughs> and Michael enlists her help to figure out what's going on. And she does the same thing to him. She says, you know what? We just got to relax. Oh yeah. Let's fun. go karaoke. Let's go do yeah. some karaoke. Let's go get some frozen yogurt. Um, let's just, you know, just take it easy where you're working too hard. Right. So I thought that was an interesting um an interesting parallel, parallel. yeah mm. ski ball <laughs> cheating in <laughs> yes. <and> ski ball <laughs> yes time honored tradition and another callback we do to season 1 is when michael says take it sleazy because none of the humans actually know that mm-hmm. that's not a call out to any human it's a call out to the audience which is really interesting yeah episode 7 of season 1 the eternal shriek yep when he was going to retire himself Mm -hmm. Uh, and he says you know i always wanted to say this yeah he always wanted to get a rewards card (laughs) um (laughs) eat a saltine yeah Yeah. and say take it sleazy yeah or talk briefly to somebody and then say take it sleazy yeah so that's that's one thing that he says that makes us aware that it's actually him which is nice because now we can stop assuming or theorizing that Michael is also not really Michael. Mm -hmm. We already know Janet has been replaced with bad Janet. We get that. We're not going to do that again with Michael. And it only needed that one simple line. Yep. Mindy would not have known about that. Nope. And it's bad Janet. Bad Janet wouldn't have known about that because she didn't show up till I think the next episode of season one after that had happened. Mm. So, yeah. (laughs) So that's a, a classic TV trope. The the doppelganger or the spot the imposter mm-hmm, mm-hmm. and i just thought it would be interesting to point out a few other shows that deal with that a lot and i came across quite a lot of episodes of buffy <laughs> really oh yeah okay <laughs> so the episode where xander gets duplicated yep, yeah we've got two xanders and that was fun and then but that was a twist on that too so yeah that was cool it was one. absolutely a twist on that and then there was the kind of a twist on it as well when giles is turning into a demon right and Buffy can tell that it's him because nobody, <laughs> no one else can look quite that annoyed with me when she looks into his eyes. <laughs> That's the way she can tell. Aww. And then, of course, the Faith and Buffy episode when they swap bodies. Mm-hmm. Again, these are all little twists on the whole spot the imposter. Yeah. Trope. Guys, if you're not watching Buffy right now, after all of the Buffy mentions we have had on this show... I don't know what you're doing with your life. Yeah, if you're like, well, it's from the 90s, it's kind of lame. Just like... Just get over yourself. I'm okay with you just stopping this podcast, going, watching all seven seasons, and coming back. Hey, we'll wait. It has nothing to do with the good place. We'll wait. I'm aware. I don't care. (laughs) And then another, to a lesser extent, when Spike builds Robot Buffy. And um, another show that did this quite a lot was Fringe. Oh, yeah. No spoilers, but in season three, it happens right at the beginning. So it's really I love how fun. we've adopted a no spoiler policy with Fringe, but we're just like out here like spoiler tastic with Buffy. Hey, Buffy's been on since late nineties. And also, lastly, I mean there's loads of shows that do this, but I thought Rick and Morty did a really good job. Oh yeah. Um thro- flipping this trope on its head. Um the close Rick counters of the Rick kind, a bunch of Rick clones are chasing after the original Rick and one Rick says, you know what? We're just going to put a bunch of red X's on our foreheads. So in case anybody (laughs) tries to do like spot the double, you'll know which is the real one. So I thought that was fun. Fun trope. Yeah. And I'm I'm glad that we didn't do it with Michael. Throughout the whole episode, I was kind of worried and I thought, okay, how are they going to do this? Because 
as I wrongly predicted last episode, it wasn't another Michael. Mm -hmm. So then how are we going to prove it? And they ask him to take off his Michael suit. What did you think about them choosing not to do it? I understand it because Michael is really worried about losing his friendship with the humans. Right. He's so concerned. He always has been ever since he started this, the cockroach club. (laughs) <laughs> team cockroach um cockroach club sounds fancy yeah like they're gonna go golfing <laughs> so I, I i think i really get that like if you see me as my true form the way i really am are you still gonna look at me the same way right it's like it's kind of it's not the exact same but if somebody is embarrassed about showing their friends who they really are whether they're gay or if they're coming out and they, they're they afraid that their friends aren't going to look at them the same way. What? I agree with you. I'm just not loving conflating gay with <laughs> 6,000 That's foot the only thing. fire squid monster, <laughs> literal demon that Michael You is. obviously I know, know I'm I know, not I, talking I know, about I know, that. I know. <laughs> just saying. The analogy is maybe one we don't want to make. <laughs> well, what else can we analyze it or analogy it? I think potentially um, just like a secret that you have that you feel is going to change uh, your friends' perceptions. Yeah, a personal secret of some kind. Not to say that that secret is, you know, makes you a monster or anything, but just something that would make people look at you differently. Right, Um, like if somebody is into diaper play. Yeah, which like, whatever, man. If you're into that stuff, you got a consenting partner, do you, I guess, right? But... You might not want to announce it at job interviews because people are going to look at you differently. Right. I get that. And logistically, I think that it's better that they didn't show Michael because in horror movies, for example, it's always scarier when you barely see the monster. Like if Mm -hmm. the monster's in shadow or they only show you glimpses, that kind of thing. It's always more frightening um, what's in your imagination than what is on screen. Yeah. And... Michael is supposed to be this terrifying creature, right? Mm. He talks about how terrifying he is. So if we actually saw on this TV show, if we actually saw like a 6,000 foot fire squid, I don't think it would be that scary. I think it would be kind of funny looking. Mm -hmm. Just because I'm thinking like production wise, the lighting and the atmosphere on this show is not a horror show. Yeah. And the CGI has been acceptable and passable. but Oh yeah, Absolutely. But for something like that, I think it would just be a little funny. Especially since there's so much goo. and Yeah, there's a lot of juice. A lot of juice. Eleanor, there's so much juice. Yeah. <laughs> Plus, I think as much as it works for his friends, it also works for us, the audience. We, I mean, it's one thing seeing Ted Danson and hearing that he's a demon. And it's a different thing to like see Ted Danson's skin just fall away and this giant squid pop out. Yeah. It would definitely change the way that we, the audience, look at Michael. So Yeah, I agree. I think it was a wise choice. (laughs) But at the same time, I'm totally with Jason where I'm like, I want to see this. That sounds cool. Totally dope. I know you say it's not dope, but it's probably dope. (laughs) I thought maybe he'd like pull up a picture or something of (laughs) him and Sean. And you only see like a tiny little part of this bottom squid tentacle or something. (laughs) Be like, that's me. Oh, that was, that was me. That would be funny. Yeah. I mean, you just have to piece the rest of it together, but you get the idea, right? You can see there's a lot of juice right there on yeah. the floor. <laughs> Someone's got to walk behind me with a mop the whole time. Sean it's is just... drenched in goo. <laughs> <laughs> it's just, it's a lot of manpower to deal with this. Um, yeah. So that was pretty, that was pretty neat, actually. Now this still about Michael. I'm glad that he admits to them that he lied about um, his freak out to Eleanor. It really seemed like it was this giant retcon when he, you know, agreed that he just panicked Mm -hmm. or made it seem like he panicked so she would take over. And I, I was really disappointed with that. So I'm glad it turns out he was just lying. And that actually does make sense. Especially since it was such an awkward moment, like the scene itself, the way he acted, the way he he responded to Eleanor, it was really fishy. So yeah. I'm glad there's some explanation for that fishiness. Yeah. (laughs) All these weird Michael moments that we've noticed over the past few episodes have started to really build up. Yeah. And then as a viewer, it's it's kind of like we start to feel like Eleanor. We begin to get all these suspicions. And as we're looking back, we're like, all these moments 
wait a minute. <laughs> Could it actually be a demon? Yeah. So. No, they really did do a good job of putting us in Eleanor's shoes. I, I guess, did not expect that. Yeah, I guess I wish that I had been even more in Eleanor's shoes. Like, if there had been other things that we didn't know about. Hmm. That he had lied about. I don't know. Just something. I don't know if anyone out there is listening and feeling the same way that I do, but I hope so. I hope there's at least one person that does so that I don't just sound like, I don't know, an ungrateful child. <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the handcuffs thing was interesting because I didn't think that handcuffs would reveal a Janet's true identity. I thought they just made them loopy. Maybe it just removed some of her power, right? Because, mm. and she's using a lot of her power to maintain this appearance. Yeah. Maybe that's why she keeps talking about being so overworked. Although that's also part of the messing with them. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah, that was surprising. But I gotta say, the second she didn't say not a girl, I knew it wasn't her. Yeah. So. I looked over to you and I said, <laughs> she didn't say not a girl. Yeah. And I thought maybe this was an evolution or some kind of, but nope. Nope. We noticed it immediately, though. <laughs> oh, yeah. It was very noticeable. It's very suspicious. Mm-hmm. And I don't know, like, how how scary is it now that Sean can give back Janet's all these abilities? Our Janet is no longer the most advanced Janet in the universe. I think as soon as the judge finds out about this, Sean's going to be in trouble. <laughs> Do you think the judge is going to find out? They don't really want her to know, so she She'll find out at the, the end experiment. of the experiment. Oh, man. Now I'm just excited to see Maya Rudolph's reaction because it's going to be great. It's going to be over the top in every way possible, and I am here for it. She's going to tell everyone that while she was busy taking a bubble bath, <laughs> Sean was being a straight up B. <laughs> I love it. I want that so much. Can Maya Rudolph be in every show? <laughs> <laughs> so the main thing that I want to talk about in this episode is Glenn. 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 He shows up. Like a white knight. Nah. He says that he loved torturing humans because he thought they deserved it. And all the demons have been told that everyone in the bad place was evil and beyond repair. So, you know, they feel okay doing what they're doing. But now he's not so sure that he believes that anymore. Mm -hmm. And that to me is very interesting. I really like it. I think it's cool. It reminds me a lot of a soldier questioning his orders or someone who's like finally seeing the truth after years of living in and participating in some sort of oppressive system. Like growing up in a racist family or, you know, having a, a sexist dad, that kind of thing. And then right. learning, unlearning all of that stuff. Yeah, because the last time we saw Glenn was in the last webisode of The Selection. Where he's talking to Sean uh, about the Michael suit. And Glenn says, I thought we were just trying to prove the system works. This all feels like cheating right so it seems like glenn is different than all of his other cohorts yeah sure cohorts <laughs> is a good word yeah it seems like he's a little bit different he's a little more thoughtful and sensitive mm -hmm. i can't imagine sean saying the same kind of thing so in a message that we received from anna and i will read the whole thing in a, the mailbag section she talked about torture and she said that torture is objectively bad even for bad people so I want to discuss torture. <laughs> I'm wondering, do demons need to be talked into torturing humans or is that their nature? Well, a lot of them think? seem to just straight up enjoy it. Yeah. They love it. They get off on it. They are excited to think of new ways to torture people, to find the best method to torture someone. Yeah. It feels to me like some of these demons are just born bad. Hmm. But then at the same, on the other hand, Michael liked torturing as well. He seemed to love it and get a lot out of it. But as soon as he found out that maybe these people didn't deserve it, that's, his views changed. That's when things changed for Michael, when he understood firsthand that human beings could improve. That's mm -hmm. when he didn't believe in the system anymore. That's when Glenn started questioning the system. So I wonder how other demons would react. I mean, we've seen other demons that are not like Sean. Sean seems to be especially evil. I mean, he's especially evil even to Glenn. I mean, some of the other demons seem kind of like regular people doing a job. Right. 
when shown a broken system, will any of them show any desire to reform? Do you think that the bad place operates under any moral rules? No, I think that would be counterproductive. I think the rule of the bad place is there are no rules. Just whatever the head, Hancho, Sean in this case, says goes. Mm. So it's it's like complete anarchy. Right, but it's not. We've seen it and it's not anarchy. It's a business. It's... Yeah. <laughs> when so many people love torturing, they're all going to work together to make sure that it happens. Yeah. The most efficiently, the most efficient way, the funnest way, the orderly way. I don't know. It, it's a weird thing to think about. Yeah. So do you feel like they're torturing as punishment or do you think they're torturing for a sadistic pleasure? I think they're doing it under pleasure under the pretense of punishment. Okay. So they're saying, oh, well, yeah, we have to, we have to torture them because this is the bad place. Right. I mean... Who am I to say that I really enjoy penis flattening <laughs> or, right. you know, bees with teeth with teeth or penises or penises with teeth. I was thinking bees with penises. <laughs> yeah, it, it's interesting to me because we see that even like we see even in Glenn and in Michael, they both seem to still have an affection for the actual act of torture. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Michael sometimes fondly talks about the stuff that he did and and other times is aware that it wasn't a good thing and feels guilty about it but glenn even in this episode was saying oh well you know i was actually the one to figure out how to blow them back up so they could be flattened again so <laughs> and he's proud of himself he's smiling about it i don't know he just has this like gleeful feeling about it but at the same time, he's wondering if it's a morally right thing to do. Right. Like when you're really good at your job and you find out your job isn't a good job, but you're still really good at it. Right. Ah, like Eleanor. Exactly. When she was selling medication. <laughs> fake medicine. Fake medicine. Chalk. <laughs> yes. <laughs> to old people. Right. Right. And she was, she was top really salesperson five years running. So what Eleanor was doing is very similar to maybe what Glenn was doing. Enjoying the work itself and still realizing it's not good work. <laughs> Do you feel like the demons have a sense of what is right and what is wrong? It's very skewed. And I wonder if that's from thousands of years of doing the same thing. Mm, so being in that system, being like, in that environment. like spending your childhood and adolescence in a home that is incredibly racist or right. sexist or... You grow up thinking that's the right way. Yeah. And then once you find out that it's not, you still have that mentality, like you really have to break free, but it takes time. It takes years, mm -hmm. maybe therapy or maybe just exposure to reality. <laughs> <laughs> Life and all the wonderful differences. Right. Yes. Interesting. Okay, so then I I just want to talk about torture uh, and get some, some conversation going here. Uh, so I looked up an article on the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy about torture. That's funny. The Stanford experiments. Right, The Stanford right. prison experiments. Right, interesting. No relation, I'm sure, but <laughs> just a funny little tidbit. So in the article itself, it said... It's generally held that torture is defined as part of the deliberate infliction of extreme suffering and that, by virtue of this defining feature, torture is morally wrong. Note that even actions or practices that are inherently morally wrong might be morally justified in extreme circumstances. Or to put things another way, performing an evil action might be morally justified if refraining from performing it constitutes a much greater evil. <laughs> And it's interesting because we're always thinking of torture as this like, oh, well, we could save lives and in an extreme circumstance and as sort of a means of interrogation. But in this universe, that's not what torture is at all. There's nothing that's that they're nothing. trying to get out of it. Exactly. So I was looking up on the United Nations uh, website. You can see the Convention Against Torture and Other Cruel, Inhumane and Degrading Treatment. Uh, or punishments, and it lists four different reasons for torture. Uh, one, to obtain a confession. Two, to obtain information. Three, to punish. Four, to coerce the sufferers or others to act in a certain way. So yeah, that's definitely, those are all possible purposes for torture. And also, so is torture performed for sadistic reasons, right? Right. The bad place tortures humans to punish them, and they also seem to be receiving sadistic pleasure from it. 
And it's, it's just interesting. Like there's a lot of torture out there in pop culture that focuses around interrogation. Um, I mean, you see it in like 24, Mm -hmm. stuff like that, but there's a lot of torture as punishment and torture as means of sadistic pleasure in pop culture too. Like the Punisher, Dexter, uh, Outlander, Misery, which we just watched, uh, A Clockwork Orange, and even Toy Story. Honestly, even in a child's movie right? Mm -hmm. Sid is torturing those toys for pleasure. He's not trying to get anything out of them. He's not trying to get a confession, uh, uh, information. He's not trying to get people to act in a certain way. He's just doing it for the thrill of doing it. Right. So what exactly is the aim of the torture in the bad place? These people are never going to die. They don't have any information for you. You don't want them to behave in a certain way. They're not being tortured so that they will become better people. Uh, what is the point other than sadistic pleasure? Right. I never really, I guess I'm, I'm over here like, oh my God, like I just discovered something, but I never really thought of it as torture in the way that you think of torture on a TV show that graphically shows you someone being tortured, right? And the pain, the suffering that is being inflicted on them. Mm -hmm. I feel like maybe this show is going to find a different way to deal with people. I wonder if they're going to ever yeah, address... they're going to take them to school and teach them how to be better people. So you're saying that you believe that the way the show is going to end or the direction that the show is going is going to be kind of reforming the bad place or reforming the methods of torture that they use. It's hard to talk about torture in a show like this. It's a sitcom that has an overarching story with a bit of a theme and makes you think about morality and ethics. But at the same time, there's constantly jokes about torture Mm -hmm. all the time. Every couple episodes, several jokes. It's something that we can laugh about or, oh, this person's being tortured by getting their penis flattened. And like, oh, that's so funny to think about. And then, but if you dig into it more, it's terrifying. Oh, it absolutely is. It becomes... You know, Michael talking and joking about someone's penis being flattened to an episode of Game of Thrones where someone's genitals get mutilated. Right. And so those are very different. The 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 vibe is very different. The vibe is very different, but the core of it is the same. It's all about presentation. But that's the thing is it's all about presentation. It's all out of sight, out of mind, right? Like Michael's original true form. Exactly. And so I feel... let me quickly go in if we saw all these things that they were talking about all these things we wouldn't be able to watch the show the same way oh no we wouldn't i guess that's kind of my point Mm -hmm. is that i feel like it needs to be addressed because the good place is that kind of show it's that kind of show that's going to try to give us a satisfying conclusion where we feel optimistic about things it Mm. is on top of everything i think that the good place is optimistic right and i don't feel like they could leave us with millions upon millions of people are being tortured and we just have to deal with it yeah and we just have to deal with it like in the first episode of this show it's what happened to everybody else oh don't worry about them don't worry about them uh no definitely (laughs) worry about them it's interesting because we see the world reflected back at us in this show we have all these different treaties that forbid committing acts of torture and outsourcing torture to countries. But then we have countries trying to get around these laws. And even in countries where torture is illegal, like Canada and the United States, we still have police brutality, prisoner abuse, for-profit prisons, solitary confinement, all these different methods Mm -hmm. that are not technically (laughs) torture. Right, we're skirting the line here. It's not as though torture is not called out for what it is in the good place. We talk about it all the time, but it's all out of sight, out of mind. We don't see these things happening and we don't see them happening to people that we care about. Mm -hmm. Because what the bad place is doing is like undeniably bad. It's torture. But what they do is known and accepted by everybody in the good place and by the judge. Mm -hmm. And that's just bonkers. Like this is supposed to be better than reality i feel like it's supposed to be better than reality and so we can't move forward if we don't address it Mm -hmm. in this season at some point i really want them to because the whole theme of the show so far has been people can be better people can get better yeah and if they shy from that at the end saying people can be better but yeah then 
But by the same token, what is the punishment for someone who actually inflicted great pain and suffering onto others while they were on earth? Serial killers, for example. Do I want to see the those type of people be reformed? Can those kinds of people be ever reformed? What could their punishment be in the afterlife? And if it's not torture, is it simply non-existence? Right. Do we just say, okay, well, you don't have the capacity to be a better person so therefore you will just cease to exist and you don't get the luxury of an afterlife regardless of good or bad you yeah. just and then what existing. is a bad afterlife are you just in school all the time trying to learn to be a better person i just it's so confusing and i don't know where they're gonna go with this show mm -hmm. and i really don't envy any of the writers right now because clearly i'm not thinking of a good <laughs> i am not thinking of a good finale so don't pressure. hit me up for it <laughs> that's so much pressure because do you do you give it a satisfying moral uplifting conclusion or do you ground it in reality or do you ground it in complete fantasy right like, what way is going to be satisfying and we have to put our faith in these writers and Michael Schur that it's going to be a satisfying conclusion whether it's a good one or not it has to we have to end it thinking I appreciate what they did I'm satisfied with it I may not like it but they didn't screw the pooch like they didn't <laughs> they didn't change the show just to give everyone a happy-go-lucky feeling right I feel like we have to end on an optimistic note it does not have to be perfect though right I really don't envy these writers. <laughs> I like I really don't. <laughs> this is going to be a very difficult task to do this season and do it well and do the show justice, I think. You and can do it, guys. You you absolutely can. I have faith in you. I'm just looking ahead and like, "Woo! Glad I'm just sitting on this one." <laughs> glad I am part of the audience right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, a lot of stuff that I think uh, needs to be talked about this season. I'm very interested to see if we're going to talk about it at all. Yeah, torture can't take a back seat because at the end of the day, it's a big part of the show. Yeah. It's kind of the main point. Yeah. I mean, it seems as though we're heading towards a purgatory style neighborhood. But does that mean we're still going to have a bad place where millions of people are still being tortured? Cause right. You know, that's still not great. Yeah. And someone like the judge who has overseen all of this for, you know, since the beginning of time. Yep. Does that make her as bad as Sean? Yeah. For does letting that make it happen. Guilty by association? Yeah. It's, it's interesting. Yeah, it is. It's dark. It guys. is dark. I took you on a real dark turn. I'm sorry. I'm watching way too many horror movies because it's October and Jason's a big spooky movie person. Well, maybe we can dive into a little bit more lighthearted moment. Okay. Sounds good. The sex toys. Oh my God. Did you notice anything <laughs> fun in, in that collection? Because I got a few. No, I just noticed the things that he pointed out and then I wished that he hadn't pointed them out. <laughs> well, I noticed a tank of helium. Oh, okay. Um, some Punch and Judy puppets on the top shelf. Pungent Judy? Punch and Judy. Oh, I was like, is there a smelly fetish? Pungent Judy? <laughs> Ooh, she real stank. She got that good stank. <laughs> and of course, that weird whisking device that Derek comes and grabs. Like, it's got six whisks on attached to like a bike wheel that you turn the bike wheel and it just whisks. And I don't want to know how it works. It looks like but a futuristic um, barista tool. Yeah, I'm very fascinated by it. <laughs> Um, and then the waffle maker with golf tees stuck on it, which for some reason ended up in the living room on the table. Oh. I don't know how it got there or who brought it out there. I'm guessing Jason, but... <laughs> and a bike horn. Well, yeah. Who doesn't love the sound of, the sound of a bike horn? Wah, wah. Brings back memories of childhood when you were just learning about your burgeoning sexuality. Yeah, mom and dad come in with the bike horn. <laughs> and they say, it's time right, to talk cut. about the we're... bike horn and the waffle maker. <laughs> oh. And when 
Eleanor goes to take a break and goes for a walk and meets up with Chidi. Oh, yeah, that was sweet. The Although rest... I did feel bad for Chidi. <laughs> the anxiety is ever-present. Oh, goodness gracious, that beast. <laughs> that crime against nature. It was scary the second the eyes popped up. It was like, oh, no, this is going to be bad. And Chidi screams and he's like, oh, no, 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 no. Oh, and it didn't look like it could support itself. It was terrible. Yeah. Oh. Bad Janet must have been laughing inside. Oh she must gosh. have loved it. Yeah. And there was a restaurant behind Eleanor and Chidi, Luncheons and Dragons. Oh, cute. Yeah, I thought cute. that was really cute. I like that. I totally missed it. And of course, Eleanor takes the leftover nachos and next scene we see it's an empty plate and she's licking her lips like, you devoured those. And it makes sense in the good place because we always see shows where small white women are eating absurd amounts of food and they never gain a pound. But in the good place, it's canon that you can be in the good place and eat as much as you want and never gain a pound. Mm -hmm. So I'm okay with that. (laughs) And then at the end, we have Jason wearing his outfit from the Rhonda, Diane, Jake and Trent episode. Looking smashing. We both went for S words. I like it. Okay. Okay. Cool. Yeah, that was some good stuff. I'm definitely looking forward to next episode. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to be a lot of fun. I felt like this one was just kind of a, we needed to get from point A to point B. How are we going to do that? Let's do it. Done. So now we're at the B and we got to see what the the B is all about. Yeah. What's happening at B? What's happening at B town? Bad place town. Mm. Maybe next episode it's going to happen. What's happening at BP? And I don't mean Boston pizza. It's going to be in real time. So Jason and Michael are going to be pumping the handcart the entire episode. Like in 24. Like they got to get the other side of the city. So one episode, they just got to be driving. Well, they'll listen to a podcast. Right. Uh... (laughs) On that note, shall we talk about our mail? Absolutely. It's a cruel world after all. It's a cruel world after all. It's a cruel world after all. And we'll read some mail. Huzzah! (laughs) Mail song is back! (laughs) We're back, baby, and worse than ever. (laughs) So true. (laughs) Okay. All right, so we've got a Facebook message from Danielle, who says, I really appreciate you guys talking about Eleanor's right to her feelings, justified or not. Doesn't matter. We can feel things. Emotions are tricky and you just got to feel them. Yeah. Being a human is hard. (laughs) Danielle also said in her message, it's funny that my Facebook message last time said that I thought episode three was slow and yet listening to your guys recap and review made it so much more interesting. So thank you for helping me appreciate it even more. Well, thank you very much. I'm really glad that listening to the podcast made it more interesting for you. That's definitely our goal. Mm -hmm. Um, I love that other podcasts will do that for me. So... That's pretty much what I intended with this podcast when we started it. (laughs) Danielle also says, I don't know how you guys predict so well, but I had no idea Glenn was going to be the one on the hand pump car. And I spent all of episode four waffling between thinking Michael was really him and thinking it was Vicky. Did you guys wonder at all or were you always sure? We are absolutely 100% never sure. (laughs) We are watching the show right along with the audience. So we're just... Out here making some wild predictions, but we happen to have a microphone. And we watch the episodes a lot, so we might catch (laughs) things that other people may not. Subtle nuances, ways that Glenn was acting in that web series Mm -hmm. and the past interactions we've had of him kind of gives you a bit of a tip off. Yeah, a little bit. And it's just honestly really fun when it turns out that we're right. (laughs) Yeah, and it's still okay when we're wrong. Yeah. It's not as satisfying, but we don't get that moment of, ah ha called it. <laughs> oh, that moment is usually so loud when it's me. <laughs> I am so loud. Um, Danielle said, did you suspect it was bad, Janet, when Jason called her girl and she didn't immediately respond with not a girl? I got excited thinking it was just the latest in her advancements to personhood. Um, <laughs> so as for Janet, we already said, I totally knew as soon as she res- didn't respond with not a girl and this is super personal but i would be very sad if she was to lose that response on this journey to personhood because 
I'm non-binary. And so that's kind of a response that I always want to use when people mistakenly call me miss or lady or something like that. And I just like that we have this being because we know she's not a girl. She's not a human. She's not all these things, but Mm. a being that is so feminine on the outside and who is always mistaken for a girl who's just not a girl. Mm -hmm. And that's okay. Yep. Just accepted by the people around her, even when they forget. Yep. So. So thank you very much, Danielle, for your message. We always look forward to reading them. So our next was a Twitter message from Alan um, from his Shadows and Shamblers account. I'm assuming it was Alan anyway, since he is the uh, religion guru. Um, So he said that Kant was a Lutheran who found the philosophical proofs for God's existence to be inadequate. So he refuted them. Vivian mentioned his attack of the ontological argument, but his entire philosophy was Christianity through the lens of rationalism. He basically says humans are too limited to observe the true nature of the universe, let alone God, but we can reason out how we would like to be treated and apply that to other people. So here's a list of rules you should follow, no matter the consequences to yourself or others. So Kant sidesteps the embarrassing literal interpretation of the Bible, but ports all over the behavioral rules. He absolutely believed in an afterlife and a teleological destiny for human utopia in the future. His categorical imperative is problematic because it justified the European view that they knew best and everyone should follow the same rules, Christian rules. Uh, Nietzsche burned him best. His morals are only a sign language to his emotions. (laughs) So thank you, Alan, for that. This is a much clearer explanation to what I was trying to say last week. Philosophical burn. And uh, clearly I just just don't have the background in religion. Um, So I really appreciate that. Thank you. And I'm glad that Chidi thinking of Eleanor as God is still aligned with his morals as a Kantian. I think that's really interesting because that's what was kind of bugging me about that moment. So, Mm -hmm. And we have a Facebook message from Diane who said, I just realized how we can tell it's Michael and not Vicky. Take it sleazy. That expression is from season one and Vicky only showed up in episode eight, so she wouldn't have known it. It's definitely a shout out to viewers because Eleanor should not remember that reboot. Right. Yep. We we mentioned that. And it's definitely a, a little shout out to, to humans, us viewers, <laughs> Yep. as they've all been rebooted since then. So it was kind of Michael's opportunity to use that phrase. Yeah. And I like that you pointed out Eleanor shouldn't remember that either. And she doesn't. She doesn't remember. And that's not the reason why. Yeah, that's not the she... catalyst. Yeah, that's not the reason why she believes Michael. She believes him because he was willing to sacrifice himself just as she noticed that Cheaty is still very much Cheaty because he's willing to make himself miserable to try to make the world a little bit better, Mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. So. All right. Thanks, Diane, for your Facebook message. Our next message comes from Anna, and this is the one that inspired the conversation about torture. Um, So Anna said, here's my current theory after season four, episode four. The show's trajectory isn't actually towards getting human into the humans into the good place. It's going to be eliminating the bad place because everyone is redeemable and torture is objectively bad, even for bad people. Yes, even Brent. <laughs> so obviously, I really like your theory, Anna. I mean, so far we have two demons that don't have faith in the afterlife system and hopefully more are going to follow. Maybe there's going to be some kind of revolt in the bad place, which could be really interesting. I don't know. We shall see. And I did want to clarify that when I said I felt Brent was irredeemable, I didn't, I just meant that I didn't think he could become a good person. Right. Yeah. Not like <laughs> he deserves to be with the, the serial killers. And no, all those. I don't, I do not think he should be tortured for all of eternity. I just think he's kind of a douche <laughs> and he's probably going to stay kind of a douche forever. I just don't think he really cares to become much of a better person. So I don't know that he will. What do you think of this theory, Jason? I think it's an interesting idea. I don't think that's going to happen because if there's a good place, there's got to be a bad place. So there has to be balance in order to have order. Because right now the playing field is so vastly different. They're on. They're not even on the same playing field. It's like one is playing soccer and the other is playing, I don't know, water polo. So... <laughs> They need to maybe equalize everything. So bring everything closer to a better balance. Right. So maybe the good place isn't for such elite, good, extreme samples of goodness. And maybe the bad isn't for such extreme badness. 
But you wouldn't you want the bad place to be for people of like extreme badness, the serial killers, well, and not just they, the people who reheated fish in a microwave. No, I don't think. I think there <laughs> needs to be a worse place. Oh, just like there is not at all a best place. Right. So <laughs> having a worse so tears. place. Yes. A tiers of bad places, but not tiers of good places. Uh, the seven levels of hell type of thing. Okay. Right. And one level of heaven. Right. So every good person, no matter how good they were, goes in the good place, but there are tiers of bad. So I think but that would be fair. what if you were really good? Like you were like really a good person then you're still as just as good as the person who just squeaked by ah, okay because they all still right. did good <laughs> all right all right yep okay those are my thoughts <laughs> i think there should be layers of hell layers levels of bad places like an onion sure yeah levels of bad places versus one single good place okay it seems only fair sure <laughs> okay Thank you very much for your message, Anna. All right. And finally, we have a Twitter message from Lexi, which is very long. So I'm only going to read a small portion of it. Yeah, it's all about Eleanor and Chidi's relationship. She wanted to share it with people who heart that couple as much as she does. She says that she feels Eleanor and Chidi's story is going to be flipped this season. She thinks that Chidi is going to realize he loves Eleanor. Although he may deny it at the beginning because he does have a soulmate to think of, but he's eventually going to say that he loves her. Um, because so far, their their love story has always had the same structure. Lexi says, number one, someone gives Eleanor information that makes her realize she loves Chidi. Number two, Eleanor tells Chidi she loves him. Number three, Chidi pushes back, denying or not accepting his true feelings. Number four, Chidi realizes he loves Eleanor and tells her. And then number five, memory gets wiped. That's her, that's her hope for the season. And I gotta say, I, I, I don't remember exactly when, but I did mention this in a previous episode that I wanted them to switch things up um, because I didn't want to keep seeing Eleanor be the one to put herself out there. Mm. Uh, I wanted to see that desire and Chidi. I wanted him to take that leap. I do understand that it makes a lot more sense in terms of their characters to have Eleanor be the one who takes that step. Um, but I really hope, Lexi, that you're right about our lovebirds this season. I hope that Chidi is going to fall madly in love with Eleanor and deal with what that means for him and Simone, uh, what that means for him as a human being versus her as this, you know, potential architect godly figure whatever yeah they, see that would be very interesting to see what chidi does in that situation like him struggling over his feelings for this divine being like well obviously i'm gonna love this <laughs> thing like why wouldn't everyone love eleanor like right she's the architect she's this god right so obviously my feelings are normal but i'm still struggling with the like it's it could be interesting. And it's a great parallel to Jason and Janet in season one, where he's just this lovable idiot and she is this amazing, like, powerful being. And yet he totally falls in love with her. I mean, granted, she's kind of lost some of her power at that point, lost some of her memories, but she is his superior? <laughs> superior being. Yeah, she sure. is a superior being. And in this... And in Chidi and Eleanor's circumstances, she's kind of a superior. So, Lexi, we're going to be looking out for that. And don't apologize for your crazy long emails, ever. We always love it. Yes. <laughs> All right, well, that brings us to the end of our episode. All right, and just a reminder, everybody, this is the absolutely last week to enter in our keychain draw to win one of our awesome Fork and Bull shirt keychains. Send us a message through our social media with the keyword switcheroo. And that brings us to the end of Fork and Bullshirt, a multiverse radio production. If you're a fan of the show, please leave us a rating and a review on iTunes. Tell all your friends, your neighbors, your bad Janets. And if you want to get in touch with us, we're on Twitter at Multiverse Radio and Facebook at Multiverse Radio Podcast. Please use the hashtag FBullshirt to send us your thoughts. You can also email us directly from our website, multiverseradio.ca. I'm Jason. And I'm Vivian. See you next week. <laughs>